This is the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting in the North Index Clovis Carver Library, um, September 9th, 2020, at 3 o'clock. Um, can we uh, declare a quorum and call roll, please? Chairman Smith? Yes, here. Vice Chairman Moore? Commissioner Morrison? Here. Commissioner Soule? Here. Commissioner Garza? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner North? Here. We do have a quorum. Uh, the second item is approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Morrison? Yes. Commissioner Soule? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. Okay, we have approval of the agenda. Uh, our next item on the agenda is approval of minutes of July 8th, 2020. Uh, that was the last meeting of planning and zoning. Uh, do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Morrison? Yes. Commissioner Soule? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. All right, we move on to old business. There is no old business at this time, so the next agenda item, item three, is new business. Um, item A is approval of the City of Clovis Unified Development Ordinance, UDO, the text amendment of Chapter 17.55.010 about outdoor lighting. And I will turn to uh, Mr. Gordon and uh, your recommendation on this. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, uh, staff's recommendation is on page, beginning on page seven of your binders. Uh, this, what this text amendment does, it, it limits uh, the intensity of the light source in a residential district, and it also prohibits light on a residential property from spilling over onto another lot or uh, the city's right of way, which is the street or the, or the alley uh, right of way. And so, <clears throat> what we have done, beginning on page seven, uh, the underlying <clears throat> writing is the amendments that we're, we're actually wanting to make to this particular chapter of the outdoor lighting. And so, I also put a copy of the actual uh, chapter in your binders on page 11. And so, we, we can follow if you want to flip from page 8 to 11. Um, so, so, in this particular chapter, uh, the purpose is going to uh, remain the same on page 7. And then, and under item B, uh, the only change is... Uh, right after the date that we adopted the uh, Unified Development Ordinance, which was last year, um, the words, unless otherwise specified herein, we're adding that to that particular um, section. And then item one, we're adding, uh, other than section 17.55.1, Zero C four to item one, and then of course uh, for C we're adding number four, and that language that you see uh, on page eight, and I'll, I'll read that language for the sake of the audience. So number four we're adding um, residential lighting regulations pertaining to lighting located upon lots occupied by residential buildings containing fewer <coughs> than four dwelling units. So if you own a single family residential dwelling, then this language <laughs> now applies to you. The way the code is currently written, it, it was it was um, it was four dwelling units. So now it pertains to a single family a residential dwelling. And A it says the location of the lighting fixture together with, with its cutoff angle shall be such that it does not directly shine on any public right-of-way or any other residential property. So 
So the angle of the lighting, now we're saying that it has to be angled so that it does not shine directly onto any public right-of-way or any other residential property. B, it says, it shall not have an off-site luminance greater than 1,000 foot lambers. It shall not have an off-site luminance greater than 200 foot lambers measured from any private property or in a residential zone. And C, it says, where on site lighting is provided, the location of all light poles shall be indicated on the site plan, the plat, or the survey. And D, for sites, it says, smaller than five acres, the maximum height of a light pole measured from the finished grade to the top of the pole shall be 20 feet. So if you own property less than five acres, the maximum height of the pole is 20 feet. E says, for sites five or more acres, the maximum height of a light pole measured from the finished grade to the top of the pole shall be 30 feet. So if you own property more than five acres, we're saying that the maximum height of the pole is 30 feet. And then F, it says, the regulations contained in this subsection shall take effect immediately after adoption by the city commission. And so with that, I'll stand for any questions that you might have. I know we have a, or we had a situation on the south side of town which had us look at outdoor lighting in a residential district because we had nothing to address outdoor lighting in a residential district. The commercial we do, but the residential we did not. And so we put this language together to try to regulate outdoor lighting in a residential district. And I believe Mr. Ward is here. He may want to address the commission. And I know he's been in contact with Commissioner Fidel Madrid and also Commissioner Helen Casals in reference to his situation south of town. So they may want to address the commission as well. But at this moment, if you have any questions for me, I'll stand ready for questions. Any questions from the commission? Mr. Ward, so this is just for the city to be able to enforce some regulations? Is that what we're trying to do? Yes, sir. In the residential districts. Correct. Yes. Yes. We have had many calls about neighbors having spotlights coming on in the middle of the night and staying on forever. So I think it's a good thing to have to be able to enforce something. So I like that. Thank you. Mr. Gordon, has there been any consideration for, you know, there are a lot of areas within the community that do not have street lighting, which may, you know, have caused potentially part of this issue. You know, certainly neighborhoods that have street lighting or adequate street lighting, you know, those neighborhoods typically, you know, light bulb, light fixture on the side of the house is sufficient. However, for security purposes for residents that don't have that luxury of having city lighting, you know, what considerations were given, I guess, or thoughts given to folks that live in those communities? Well, the way it's addressed in the code for the new development, I understand you're talking about existing conditions. But for new development, you're required to have a street light at every intersection and then one not less than 500 feet from there. But for those areas of town, and there's quite a few actually, that don't have, that don't meet that criteria. I believe it's on the owners to put the street light in. I'll defer to the city manager because we've had situations like that where there is no street light. And so I believe the owners have taken it upon themselves because the developer is no longer there and have joined together to 
put that street light in. Do you want to expound on that? Certainly. And as Lewis mentioned, it is something that is new to our code, and so obviously those older residential districts, they don't always have the street light. The instances that we run into with the residential properties is not necessarily the front of the homes, it's the rear of the homes. And so they're really lighting up the rear of the homes, which is impacting their neighbors. So even if they did have a residential street light in front of the home, that's not necessarily going to address the situation for the backs of the homes. But this new code would be enforced whether it be front or rear of the home. Certainly. Correct? That is correct. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Mr. Chairman, I move for approval. Well, I think we're aware of the testimony given in the example. It's not the same thing as the suggestion. Yeah, I mean, it's a little more than that. It's a one-on-one grade and drive. It's on the south side of town. It's on the fringe between the city and the neighbors. If any of y'all want to see an extreme example of what we're talking about here, I would invite you to come to my house and stand with me in my backyard. We have a person in the neighborhood who is very well-meaning and very concerned about potential crime and things like that in the neighborhood. He's taking this matter a little extreme. Like I told folks in the city before, I have no quarrel with how a person chooses to like his residence. I have a quarrel with how that person chooses to like my residence. And where I'm coming in is I don't understand the loonies and everything like that, but what I'm talking about is the angle of the light. These lights are very adjustable, and when you angle the light straight out to project light broadcasted into the neighborhood, that becomes, I would analogize it to like visual loud noise. We have ordinances that prevent people from creating loud noise disturbances. This is a visual loud noise. A neighbor shouldn't have to put aluminum foil or blinding or darkening curtains to be able to sleep in their bedroom at night. That's exactly what we have to do because we're looking at a property that has a 360-degree area of bright broadcasting lights straight out from their residence. And this is going out into the highways, going out into the alleys, going out everywhere else. And just simply angling those lights down, a minimal invasion to their rights, I believe will correct the problem. And the only thing else that I would ask is that the city help us enforce this because I've spoken. You can speak to the neighbor, and if the neighbor right now, as we currently stand, if the neighbor says, no, I'm not going to do it, there's no enforcing mechanism for that. So me, that's all I want is for when I go to ask the neighbor, hey, would you please angle that down, and can we work together to make sure that you're not broadcasting directly on the house, to be able to come to the city and say, you know, I need help with angling this down. Of course, it has to be reasonable for us both. But the only other thing that I would ask is that because the lighting is adjustable and it's easy to adjust, it's not a burden for the person, that all existing lighting that is adjustable be covered under this. In other words, if it's there now and we pass this ordinance, then I can go to my neighbor and say, hey, we have a new ordinance. You need to angle that down so it doesn't broadcast directly on my place. And that's all I ask. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It appears that it covers everything that he was just discussing, correct, in this? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Seeing no other public comment, I think we had a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Chairman Smith? Yes. Commissioner Morrison? Yes. Commissioner Stoll? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. Okay, the motion passed unanimously. Item B on the agenda is approval of conditional use for a Type 2 home occupation within the North Park Addiction. Addition, Block 5, Lot 8, 8, RS7, Residential Single Family Lot. And I will turn it over to Lewis for city recommendation. 
Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, as you all know, we adopted the Unified Development Ordinance last year in June. And so when we did that, it actually changed the home occupation requirements significantly. If you turn to page 23 of your binders, the home occupation now is separated into two separate categories. And if you look at item 3, a type 1 home occupation, it says, are those in which household residents use their home as a place of work with no employees, customers, or clients coming to the site. And then it gives you some examples of those types of home occupations. But this particular type, you can have no employees. You cannot have any customers or clients coming to the residence. And so the application that we have before us today, I believe I put a copy of the application in your binder. The applicant is actually having customers and clients coming to the location, which would be a type 2 under 3B. It tells us that a type 2 home occupation are those in which household residents use their home as a place for work and either employees or customers come to the site. And so because she has customers and clients coming to the site, over on page 24, it tells us that a type 2 home occupation may be approved as an accessory use to a principal use in the household living use category only through the conditional use procedure. And so that's what she's applying for today. It still allows her to conduct the home occupation, but it requires a conditional use because of the fact that she has customers and clients coming to the residence. And so staff's recommendation for the conditional use is found on page 15 of your binders. The planning division recommends approval of the proposed conditional use based on the following standards here. Number one, the approval of the proposed conditional use would implement and better achieve the goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. Number two, the type use meets the requirements of section 1765.110H of the City of Clovis Unified Development Ordinance, and that's for a conditional use. Number three, the proposed use is expressly authorized as a conditional use. Number four, the proposed use will not be detrimental to the health, to the safety, or general welfare of the persons residing or working in the vicinity. Number five, the approval of the conditional use will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of surrounding property for uses permitted within this particular district. Number six, the proposed conditional use will be served by adequate utilities, access roads, parking, drainage, and other important and necessary facilities, infrastructure, and community service. And then lastly, number seven, the proposed special use complies with all applicable regulations of the Unified Development Ordinance, except that it's expressly approved in accordance with the procedures of the City of Clovis UDO. And so with that, I'll stand for any questions. I believe the applicant is here. Yes, so she may want to present her item. Is there questions from the commission on this? I would like to hear from them. Yeah, I'd like to hear from her and kind of see what they're doing. Okay. Would you raise your right hand, please, ma'am? Do you swear or affirm that any testimony you give will be truthful? Yes. State your name and address, please, ma'am. Alexis Paul, 1307 Gidding Street. Okay. And I think, tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do here. So we, my husband and I, 
created a business where we have a collection of just homemade crafts that we do. He does more woodworking. I do um, handmade uh, t-shirts, vinyl items, car fresheners, wax melts, um, just a little bit of everything. But um, the only reason we needed the special application was because we had customers coming to pick up. They they don't come in the residence and we don't provide a service. It's just for them to pick up their orders so we don't have to charge a delivery fee. Um, but as far as items, it's a little bit of everything that you can kind of make at home. We um, try to add a few things every few months to kind of grow the business. Um, but that's about it. Um, so I, I commend you and you coming forward and trying to apply for this because there's a lot of homes that do that type of business and they don't, don't even bother to right. ask for permission or permits or whatever. So thank you for, for that. Um, just a quick question. What kind of hours are people going to be there uh, typically? We, we don't let anybody come pick up orders past 7, 8 o'clock. We tell them to come the next day. Okay. Um, and, of course, it's not super early and we don't get up till yeah. 8, 8 o'clock. So between 8 and 7, reasonable hours. And um, anything we do that's going to be creating noise, we have kids. So, of course, we're not going to be doing it at crazy hours of the night, reasonable hours during the day. Like the woodworking and that sort right, of thing. Right, to respect <laughs> our neighbors and, of course, our kids because they got to sleep too. Did you receive any complaints from any of your neighbors before this? No, we haven't. We, okay. uh, we recently moved in in uh, June. Uh, we were living on base. We moved off base. Um, and we did inform our immediate surrounding neighbors that we okay. would have some sound and they didn't have any um, concerns about it. Are you going to have any bright lights in the backyard? Or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Big spotlights. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else? I commend you for um, you know, the vision of entrepreneurship in this uh, time uh, with what's going on. You know, anything that, that you can do to create on your own, um, create a business in, in your home is, is a good thing. So it um, helps our community, helps you. And, um, and I think you're doing a good thing. But thank you for coming forward. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment on this issue? Okay. Mr. Chairman, move for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Chairman Smith? Yes. Commissioner Morrison? Yes. Commissioner Soule? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Item C, approval of a conditional use for a rear yard accessory dwelling unit within the Foxwood Estates Edition, unit number one, lot 25, block one. Um, I'll turn it over to Lewis for recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, uh, once again, when we were updating the uh, Unified Development Ordinance, uh, the state of New Mexico uh, had mandated that uh, the municipalities uh, adopt uh, guidelines for this particular type of use. So the state, had, the state had already adopted um, uh, guidelines for an accessory dwelling unit, uh, but we didn't have any such thing in the old code. But what this does, in, in essence, is allow. Uh, a second dwelling unit, it has to be of a certain size uh, in a residential single family district. And the purpose of that unit is, 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 is for uh, an immediate family member, uh, whether that be uh, uh, a father, a mother, father-in-law, mother-in-law, or, or children. And so, in order for that to take place, of course, it requires uh, the approval of a conditional use. And I, I put in the binder, on, starting on page 41, um, it describes exactly what an accessory dwelling unit is. Uh, it tells us where they are allowed on page 42. It tells us that an accessory dwelling unit 
they are allowed only on lots that comply with the minimum lot area regulations of the subject zoning district and that are occupied by a detached house or attached house. It says accessory dwelling units are not permitted on nonconforming lots or on lots occupied by a principal use other than a detached or attached house. So you can only put it on a property that has a detached or attached house. And you cannot have any more than one accessory dwelling unit per lot. And then item D, it says on that same page, the owner of record must either reside in the principal structure or the accessory dwelling unit for a minimum of six months of each calendar year. And this is in there because the intent is not for those structures to be leased out, but they're for the immediate family member. And so that was the requirement when we were thinking through this process that we probably needed to put something in there like that to ensure that the homeowner is either residing in the structure or in the primary, in the house itself. So on page 31, the recommendation is going to be the same for the last because this is also a conditional use approval. So if you have any questions for me, I'll stand for questions at this time. I believe the applicant is also in the audience, and he might want to present his item as well. Lewis, I have a quick question. Yes. Do they have to follow certain guidelines as far as how it looks and the aesthetics and the appeal and all that? Yes, yes. All of that in your binder starting on page 41. We're supposed to read these when you give us these? Yes, there are guidelines for erecting or converting a structure to an accessory dwelling unit. If Mr. Marr would come forward to the podium, I have a question. Raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear or affirm that any testimony you give will be truthful? Yes. Name and address, please, sir. My name is Dustin Marr. I live at 2412 Putnam. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gordon already answered the question, but I just wanted to make the question to you because he stated here that it's a shed. So the structure is going to be conforming to the house, right? Right. It's going to be a small single unit for my mother-in-law. She has numerous physical disabilities. She's getting older. She can't take care of a house on her own. And we promised her we'd be there to take care of her. So we're trying to build her a little spot. It's going to be on the west side of our house, right on the alley there, right next to the alley. We have a metal fence, a seven-foot metal fence. And then across the alley is Central Baptist. That's their lot. And they have a double row of cedars. I don't even think it will be noticeable, honestly, what we're wanting to build. I know a lot of my neighbors had some inquiries about it, and I cleared that up. They thought we were going to put up a carport for our trailer. Okay. That's not it at all. Yeah, it's just going to be a little, in our backyard, self-contained unit. Okay. Just for one person. Do you have full plumbing and everything in there, too? We will, yes. Yeah, okay. It will be full plumbing, full electric. We've got to see if we're going to do our own separate drop for the electric or not. Probably will end up being a second drop. Okay. Like a second meter? What's that? Like a second meter on there? Yeah. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Lewis, I have a question that's probably more out of curiosity than anything on this. But once these individuals move from that home, does that stay in place? The owner, the next owner, can only put in a person that lives or is related to them, or can they rent that out? How does that work? It stays in place. It runs with the land and not with the ownership. Yeah, it stays with the lot, right? That's correct. And it doesn't change anything about the other neighborhood. It's just that one. That is correct. Just that one property. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Chairman Smith? Yes. Commissioner Marston? Yes. Commissioner Stone? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Kenya? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. And that motion was approved unanimously. 
Last item is item D, approval to vacate alley right of way, a 20 foot alley to be vacated between the lot 5, Plat of Riata, addition unit 2, uh, situated in section 1T2N R35E NMPM Curry County, New Mexico, containing 5,629.622 square feet or 0 0.129 acres more or less. And I will turn over to Lewis for recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, um, there's an aerial view of this uh, Sandia uh, water tower site in your binders on page 57. <coughs> You've got Bob Spencer Park just to the uh, to the uh, south and to the west of this tower. You have a church to the north and then uh, uh, residential dwellings also to the north and to the east of this particular uh, property. And so uh, what the applicant is proposing on page 53 is a picture for exhibit A of that section of the right of way uh, that they're uh, wanting to be vacated. And so we actually uh, brought this item before the Public Works Committee. I put a copy of the, uh, the minutes in your, your binders uh, on page 55. That was uh, back in June, June 24th, uh, for a recommendation uh, concerning the vacation of this right-of-way. And it was their recommendation to, uh, to vacate uh, the right of way because of the fact that there is no uh, there's no utilities in that right of way other than uh, a water line. All the utilities either run uh, to the north of that uh, property and that alley there and then you've got utilities to the east of the tower in that alley there. And those utility services, those residential dwellings, the church and all the others that abut that alley right of way. So because of that, their recommendation was to uh, to approve uh, the vacation of the alley right of way. The staff's recommendation is on page 50 of your of your binders. And for the sake of the audi audience, again, I'll read that. It says the request for vacation of the above mentioned alleyway right of way, 20 foot alley between lot five, flat of the Riata edition, unit number two, situate. In section one, Township Two North, Range Thirty Five East, New Mexico Principal Meridian, Perry County, New Mexico, meets the requirements of the city subdivision ordinance for right of way vacation. All utilities have expressed no opposition to the proposed right of way vacation based on the fact that none have utilities located in the right of way in the right of way except uh, for EPCOR water. The owner of both lots on either side of, propose, of the proposed alley right-of-way vacation. All surrounding uh, property owners were notified and as I mentioned this item was brought before the Public Works Committee at their regular scheduled meeting on June the 24th and their recommendation once again was to approve uh, the application since there was no utilities located in the alley right-of-way. And I believe Mr. Mark Orza is here. He's with F4 Water. And uh, I don't know if he wants to come and present the item, but I'll stand for any questions that you might have. So that little portion of alley leading up to it, that's all going to dead end, right? With that behind lot 7, 6, and 8, right? There is an alley that is there currently. There is an alley that's there, um, but um, this particular property has a perimeter fence around it, and those lots that you see there is actually um, City of Clovis parking. It's a parking lot. There's no 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 uh, homes on those lots, so they don't really service um, lots uh, five. 
lot six, seven, and eight. Because it's just a, it's just a parking lot. Okay. But, you know, FCOR only wanted to vacate this particular portion of the alley and not that, that remaining portion that connects to that north-south alley to the east of the tower site. Okay. And, Mr. Chairman, I believe that FCOR is planning to vacate the remainder, or asked to vacate the remainder of that alleyway in the future as well. Mark, you may be able to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear or affirm that any testimony you give will be truthful? I do. All right. Mr. Chairman and Commission members, my name is Mark Huerta. I'm with FCOR. So the portion that we're currently asking for now, and it should be in the exhibit within your packet, is the short strip of north-south alley that's actually in between, as Lewis said, lots that FCOR currently owns. On the west side of that, we have a couple well sites that we have two wells at. And then on the east side of that alley that we're asking to vacate is where our actual elevated water storage tank and pump station is currently. So we are just asking to, at this point, vacate that piece of alley right there. It's currently not being utilized by any city vehicles and should be needed in the future. I think it was originally drawn in as part of an old plat that now would not be applicable with the way the lots are now. So that's really what we're asking for. That way we can kind of have that entire footprint for any future plans that we might have to make improvements there. Okay. Do you have any immediate plans to do something with it? So currently right now for that site, we do have some plans in the future primarily to do away with that elevated storage tank and underground booster station that currently resides there. And the wells that currently go to that site would now go to our North 40 pump stations. But we do have future plans that kind of tie into some expansion and a saddlewood addition that I think the city has indicated as a possible new service area for us, which would require an additional ground storage tank and booster station in order to feed that area as it would be upgrading from the current system. So that's some stuff that we have kind of on our radar as future stuff. And we could possibly also utilize that area to drill a couple more wells to go in along with the two that we currently have there. I have a small well field. So those are all things that we've had plans for. Okay. The reason I ask that is when there's softball games that's been utilized as parking. Yes. And so the area that we're talking about does not affect any of that parking area. It doesn't affect the alley to the north or to the east of our lot where our tank is right now. So it's an area that is within our fenced-in area, and it's not going to impact anything at all. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call roll, please, ma'am? Chairman Smith? Yes. Commissioner Morrison? Yes. Commissioner Stone? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Yes. That motion was approved unanimously. All right. We don't have any other action items. Is there anything that we need to know, Mr. Gordon, before we adjourn? You all probably already know this, but this is Mr. Commissioner King's last meeting. He has chose, because of his position with the school, not to continue to serve. And so I would just like to say we really appreciate your service to the citizens of Clovis in serving on the commission. And we'll have to bring you back and give you a plaque of some sort. But thanks for your service, John. You've done a tremendous job. I appreciate it. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it, serving with everybody else on the commission. And, you know, unfortunately, I just had to make a decision that something had to give. I had too many things on my plate. So, you know, hopefully we can get through COVID and get kids back in school and things will settle down a little bit. And maybe I can rejoin the ranks again one day. But, anyway, appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I want to echo what Mr. Gordon said. The contribution to this committee has been excellent. I applaud you for that and your commitment. And I wish you well. And I agree with you. We need to get the kids back to school. So let's hope to see. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Darren Roach to you. Darren has taken over for Mr. Wilt as our Building Safety Director. Mr. Wilt is starting to wind down his career. He's not leaving the city of Clovis. However, he's just going to be acting as our building official for this time period. And so Mr. Roach comes to us from our police department, obviously has an excellent background in everything policing. And so we thought that lended nicely into our code enforcement section that's underneath our building safety. He also has experience in the civil construction aspect. And so we thought it would be a nice transition for him and an opportunity for him to continue his career with the city of Clovis and expand on his career opportunities. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Roach, who is our new Building Safety Director. So, Darren, if you have anything you'd like to say. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to working with each one of you. We're glad to have you here. Welcome to the show. All right. Do we have anything else? Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, we are still out for the Metropolitan Redevelopment Area Survey. If anyone hasn't completed it and would like to complete it, would they please go to the City of Clovis' website to do so on SurveyMonkey. Okay. And then we're also out for the Census, just as an FYI, if you haven't filled that out yet. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Any other announcements? I remind everybody that the date and time of next scheduled meeting for Planning and Zoning Commission is October 14, 2020, at 3 p.m. North Annex at the Clovis Carver Public Library. And with that, we are adjourned.